What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, share the video, and leave a comment. Today, we got a brother calling in from federal prison who has spent numerous years of his life in prison. He escaped while he was in Chicago at the Cook County Jail. You know, he's been involved in a lot of things from, you know, putting in what we call work sometimes. And that was against the cops, against other people. But this brother turned his life around. He's doing different things now. So, David, tell the people who you are, man, where you're from, and how much time you were sentenced to. How you doing? My name is David Ernest. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. In 1997, I was sentenced to, 30, to 35 years for another violent drug offense. And in 2004, I was sentenced to another 21 years for assault on the federal officers. And in 2008, I received 15 more years for possession of a contraband, which was a homemade knife inside Cook County Jail. David, let me ask you. Let me ask you a couple questions, right? How old were you when you were first arrested? I was 29 years old when I was arrested in 1996 in Carbondale, Illinois, for the federal drug offense. Was that a nonviolent drug offense or no? That was a nonviolent drug offense. You ever been charged with violence before? I was charged with violence um 1992. I was doing time for a robbery in the in the state of Illinois. I was transferred to a correctional facility called Mount Sterling. And the same day I got there, a guy told me that I couldn't live in a cell. I tried to get a, a cell change, but the officers wouldn't do it. And when I went back to the cell uh, to tell the guy that he couldn't do it, the guy told me, no, you had to move or somebody was going to get hurt. And I tried again. The officers still wouldn't do it. And when I came back, he said, well, you know, people get killed. Uh, because they don't get moved. And when he said that, I wasn't even interested in seeing what the police was going to say. At that point, um, neither the guy or the, or the officers had my best interest at heart. So I had to take matters into my own hand. And, and I made a bad decision because I caught an assault with a deadly weapon and was sentenced to uh, six more years. And that was something that, that, and that was the same day I got to that institution. So that was one of my violent offenses um, that led to many more later on in life. But I want to, um, I want to touch the first one. I know we got limited time, right? So I want to touch on a couple things. You had an assault on a prison cop, right? Was that a stabbing or yeah. just an assault? No, it was a. It, it it wasn't a stabbing. It was done with a with a with a pipe. What had happened? I was in after I had seriously thought of the inmate in United States Penitentiary Pollock. I was transferred to FDC Houston and I had a confrontation with a few officers and what they did what they call a cell extraction to move me to another cell. They sued up and they removed me from the cell but we were fighting and they tried to twist my arm and kick me a couple of times the first time the second time they did it, and it, 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 this is almost like back to back. This almost like happened three days straight. Uh, the second time they did it, we fought in another cell, and we fell on a the the, the handicap seat in the shower that lets down. There's a pipe in there, and what happened was after we broke the seat, they just strapped me down to the bed, and they didn't remove the pipe. So, uh, uh approximately. Two or three days later, they let me up. But then they came back to um to um to do another cell extraction for no reason. Just saying that. Matter of fact, they said I broke the window, which I didn't. The glass was on the inside, and um the officer actually broke the window. Let me let me ask the you. Let, let me ask you this, David. Right. So you got that assault yeah. on the officer. You ever have to put any work in on any other prisoners in there? You ever have to stab anybody in prison? It, 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 yes. Go, going back to it, 
exactly putting in the work. It's the it's the bad decisions that we make. Right? The last series of sold I had was in 2016. Um, I stabbed the guy on the yard because he slapped my hand down from the TV. Now, as crazy as that sounds today, I thought that was a real serious offense at that time. Uh, about two weeks before then, I had a cell fight where I broke my leg, ankle, and foot. Fighting with a guy about who was looking at who. Can you believe that? <laughs> and um, before then, uh, the fights have been kind of not really a fight because we had competitions where I sat there and it was a competition that I could have, but I just refused to actually do it because it was like three people on one on, on one about something that he had did. He had violated a, 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 a code of conduct or some kind of rule that, that you just don't violate while you're in prison. And, and so, but the actually worst assault that I ever had in prison was the assault on the police officer in FTC Houston. Because that was a, you know, cell extractions are only supposed to last for like for about one minute. That cell extraction lasted eight minutes uh, with me swinging a pipe. But I was fighting against eight police officers who was in riot gear. So uh, all those things that I've done, I wouldn't do today. I understand that. But I want to ask you, we're going to get there in a minute, right, David? Okay. I just want people to understand. How old were you when you went to prison, you said? 29. How old are you today, David? 54. 54. You spent the best years of your life in a prison cell, right? Yes. Are there nights where you lay in your bed and you wish that things were different, where you just want to be free? My experience is like priceless to me. I try to use my experience to help other people, to so to, to keep them from making the same mistakes. People, as you know, people when they come in, we have these people that come in, and they might have told, they might have did something that warrants uh, what they call prison retaliatory, or violated prison rule of conduct, or anything like that. So I try to tell them, hey, look, just let the guy walk. Uh, there's really no need to harm him now because the same person that's telling me that he can't be around a rat today will go to an FCI and live amongst them for the rest of his time and he won't do the exact same thing that he would do in, in a prison setting. So to me, that's kind of an illusion. And when people say that, well, this guy told, and then I meet a guy that, that, that uh, played guilty, and I say, hey, look, some people say, when you plead guilty, you are still telling, you're just telling on yourself. So it, it's kind of a, a confusing, and uh, a conf confusing, and people have a different understanding of it. And it's unnecessary for the violence to continue, and it's what, because it's, it's something we can't solve. We, we won't solve it just by beating people to death. It, that won't happen like that. We won't, we won't reach no solutions like that. I understand. Let me ask you another question. When's your release date? My release date from the federal system is 2047, I do believe. How old were you How old will you be in 2047? Approximately 70 to 71 years old. Went to jail at 29 and you're going to be released from the Federal Bureau of Prisons when you're in your 70s. Not a good feeling, right, David? Wait, say that again now? That's not a good feeling, right? No, not at all. Not at, not at all. It, it, at some point, you want to wake up and, and sometimes just explode. But what keeps me going is that I know that I can still do some good. There's some positive things that I can do to help other people. Even in, this, even in these terrible circumstances and in my terrible, terrible situation. What prison are you at now, David? United States Penitentiary in McQuarrie. That's in Pinot, Kentucky. Is there a lot of, a lot of violence going on there still? No, not, not really here. It, it, this is like a high FCI. 
they do you had a fight, but they're mm. basically fish fights. There's a lot, a lot of contraband floating around, but it's hardly ever used. It, it's, it's not like Hazleton. In Hazleton, you have a problem. Somebody's going to get stabbed and somebody's going to get killed that same day. It's not going to, it's not going to linger long. You know, when I was at Hazleton, Whitey Bulger got killed in a, in a cell. He got there Monday night. He was there Tuesday morning. Uh, one guy came. He only had like 14 days to do before he went home. He got killed in the kitchen. I, it happened so fast. I was grabbing my tray, and I, when I seen the expression on the guy's face that was giving me the tray, when I turned around, the guy was already dead. You know, so it, it was... It's just unbelievable uh, the, uh, the level of violence from one institution to another. And this one is mild, very, very mild. But in Hamilton, you can shake somebody's hand one minute, and three minutes later, he is dead. That literally happened to me. But he, would, he didn't get killed. He killed himself. He walked in the lunchroom, asked me how I was doing, shook my hand, told me to have a good day and take care of myself. Went in his cell, put the towel up, and hung himself. How much time was he serving? Fifteen years. Can you believe that? Fifteen years. Did that affect you at all? Not, not really. The, the only effect that it really had on me is that, that I couldn't see it. And, and that bothered me. That I couldn't see a guy. Right before he's getting ready to kill himself, there's nothing I can do uh, to help him. There's nothing I can say to him because I don't know. And that's what bothered me the most. It, it was right before my face, and I couldn't see it. I couldn't interpret it. You know? Yeah. That bothered me. The, the other time when somebody killed himself, that was right next door to me in Lompoc. See, in Lompoc, they, you, when you're in a hole, they got bars there so you can pass stuff. And it was, I was right next door to a white guy. And the white guy said, hey, uh, you guys want some coffee? I had a salad. And he just gave us the coffee. And then he gave us some pictures and he gave us something else. And he said, why, we asked him, you know, hey, why are you doing that? He said, oh, man, I'm just, I'm just in a good mood. I'm just, you know, giving back. And, and we couldn't understand it. But then... Right when they were doing the count later on that night, we heard the police running and they kept running. Then we were like, we realized, hey, they right next door to us. And they went in and they cut them down and they, and they dragged them out the cell. And, and that just was an, uh, an awakening for me. And I've always been alert for when somebody started giving things away, they might be at the point of two things. They are getting ready to kill themselves or they get ready to kill somebody else. Yeah. David, I want to ask you this because yeah. I know we're on limited time here, right? The violence that you've okay. seen in the violence that you've seen in prison, the suicides, the violence that you had to inflict on other people for whatever reasons, did that affect you mentally? Any of that any of that stuff affect you mentally? Yeah. Dramatically. And, and mentally sometimes I had to check with psychology and I asked him, hey, look, can I just go for a psych bath just to see how I'm doing mentally? Because the way I see myself and the way others see me is something totally different. You know, am I acting irrational? Like, I say a lot of positive things today and people are like, hey, wait a minute, man, this is this is not who you are. Uh, this is not who I was, but it's who I am today. But this phone is, a, at this point, about to cut off. So... In about 30 minutes, I'll be able to call you back. Is that okay? Yep, let's do it. So, David, I know that phone hung up. You're back on the line. And we were talking about some of the things that you've been through, some of the things that you've seen, some of the things that you did. And one of the biggest questions was, do you think that, you know, the violence that you were involved in, how did that affect you and the violence that you've seen since you've been in prison? How did that affect you mentally? <clears throat> mentally, it... It gave me two perspectives. It made me think about how this negative energy is, is, is positive and how it is negative. But I have to every day 
focus on keeping this energy gearing, uh, uh, generated towards something positive. I think I have control of it now. You know, sometimes I have to tell people, like, for instance, two weeks ago, a guy come up to me and said, hey, old man, you know, don't make me uh, 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 have to do something to you. I said, that's okay. But like, you just make sure that you don't lose. You know, I know exactly what's going to happen if you lose. Now, I don't know what's going to happen if you win, but I know exactly what's going to happen if you lose. And he understood that, and he walked away. But I didn't get, I didn't overreact. I didn't make the situation worse. It was a, it was a way to control the situation. Because when you have this, this, this mental awareness that people are human beings, I cannot hurt somebody the way I could years ago and then go eat a bowl of cereal and not worry about it at all. I can't do that. That's what I want to, David, that's, that's what I want to ask you about. I mean, there were times back then where it didn't even affect you, where, you know, if you had to stab a guy, you'd stab him and, and who cares, right? Exactly. And today it's a little exactly. different. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's much different today, but I want people to understand this here, though. When you have somebody who has changed his behavior patterns and his way of thinking, mentally, mentally, he is aware. He's always aware. So he don't do it by choice, but he will do it by force. And you have to know the difference. As long as somebody hasn't con uh, uh, committed an act of violence, they are pretty much level-headed. They not, nine times out of ten, they won't do it because they don't understand it. However, I understand it. I know the same thing that I'm capable of doing is being capable of done to, uh, getting done to me. Like most people don't understand, you can kill somebody with a pencil. Well, it, it only takes a few seconds. So all the chaos when you when you, when you keep create this chaos, you should be aware of the fact that it could turn into something deadly and people think well with a pencil they don't you know they don't think that's possible when you think about the situation that happened in 1999 when rudy took a razor in a hole in colorado and cut a dude's heart out and threw it up against the window or the situation that happened in 2013 in victorville when huff went in there and cut snow's head off and for the life of me I still don't understand how he was able to accomplish that within an hour. You know, that blows my mind. But I understand and know that these things can happen. So that being understood, you, you see things a whole different way. And what I see today when people walk in here and they and they seen people arguing on Facebook or they might have closed their eyes or, or something like that, that's one level of violence. But this hand-to-hand -hand stuff with, with a weapon or without a weapon, there's something totally different than what they've ever seen. And you have to have a, 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 a different mentality to be even able to inflict that kind of punishment on somebody. So it, that's all, the, all in your awareness, your behavior pattern, and your way of thinking. Because if you don't think like that, you won't do it. Or if you don't understand the, the, what goes along with that, you won't do it. And that's just the bottom line. David, you've been in prison over what? 24, 25 years, right? 25 years. 25 years. And that's the that, that's what I'm trying to get at here, right? Because a lot of people can't put their mind around what it's like to spend 25 years of your life in prison. Does it hurt, man? Does it hurt? That's what the people want to know. Does it hurt that you've been in there for 25 years? It, it hurts. And it hurts bad. You have to find some kind of um, mechanism, some kind of coping mechanism. And when you can't find a coping mechanism, you have to just deal with the reality. What can you do? And when, when I thought about what I could do versus having a coping mechanism, a coping mechanism would, some be, be a, would be something like me just watching TV or playing chess or, or being the best poker player they is in the system or something of that nature. But finding something to do and dealing with the reality of it is doing something positive that will help other people avoid this type 
type of punishment or this situation, period. Let, but it, let's but talk it, about this, right? I understand that, you know, because I spent 18 years of my life in there. You have to find something to keep your mind occupied, so to speak, so that you don't dwell on how much it hurts. You did you you did escape from the Cook County Jail, right? Yes. How long were you free for? I was only free for maybe eighteen hours. What was it? it, 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 it. What, was, ahead, what was it like to escape and be out there and be free? I mean, you were free, but you weren't free because obviously you're probably panicking a little bit, trying to get away, trying to hope that they don't catch you. But what did you feel like in your mind? How did you feel? Was your heart racing? I mean, were you thinking, I'm going to get away? I'm going to get out of here? Did you have a plan? These are the things that the people want to know. Well, it, many things was running through my mind. The one thing that I told my co-defendants before we even left, I'm not going to contact nobody. I'm not doing no home invasions. I'm not going to hurt nobody. This is not a... Uh, 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 of something that somebody calls that would would want me to do this to them. Uh, uh, somebody approached me. I'm not dragging nobody's grandmother out of a car for my own selfish reason. I'm escaping because the pain of imprisonment is is, is is so unbearable you won't believe it at times. So I made a, a, a decision not to hurt nobody. I'm escaping for my own personal reasons, you know, to escape my pain. But I don't want to cause nobody else no pain. So it would, from from that point, I, once I declared that and let them know that I was not going to do that, my co-defendant actually told, you know, he told me, listen, to get away, you have to be willing to do whatever it takes. And I told him I understand that. But I'm not trying to, to cause pain for other people to relieve pain for myself. That's not what I'm trying to do. It was it was a it was a level of understanding that I reached that I really didn't understand, but I, I knew I didn't want to do that because I was growing into a level of understanding that other people are human beings too and they have rights and I don't want to violate violate their rights and then cry about somebody violate my rights. So when I got out, when they went one way, I went another way. Now, I have made it all the way to Oak Park. I think it's like maybe like 10 or 10 miles away from Cook County Jail. But I was with Arnold Joyner. Arnold Joyner went and made a phone call. And when he made that phone call, that's how they pinpointed us. And they shut down Oak Park, house by house, block by block, until they actually captured us. But the adrenaline was unbelievable. My hand was bleeding uh, real bad from jumping over, uh, climbing over a barbed wire fence. And uh, I fell off the train and got right back up and climbed right back on it. That's how I, I got 10 miles away. But the overwhelming breathing air on the outside, man, it was uh, it's crazy, but it, to me, at that moment, was like, man, amazing, and realized that I gave all this up just based on bad decisions. But it, it, it's, there's no feeling like it of uh, 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 being free. And if I had that chance to be free again today, I would never forget that. And I would never, ever do anything to come back to prison. But the sad reality of it is, and I know you might not understand this, but I know today that I have a better chance of dying in prison than of getting out. So you believe, David, do you believe that your life is going to end in prison? Honestly. Yeah, honestly. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not saying you're just going to hear violence, but I'm just saying I don't think I'm going to live to get out of to get out of prison. I think I'll be here all the way until up to 40-something, 40 40-something. 40 it would surprise me now. Yeah, I wouldn't be mad if I if I was wrong about this. I wouldn't be mad at all. <laughs> but David, from the pool, go ahead. Honestly, I feel like I hope that you get a chance, man. I really do. I hope that you get a chance to walk out of there and to be able to breathe fresh air, free air, and say, "Man, 
this is it. But it's it's a sad day when you lose, man, 40, 50 years of your life and you walk out of prison and you're just, you're like, wow, look at everything that I gave up. So when you escape, that's what you're saying. You're like, you looked at all of this stuff and said, look at everything that I gave up. And for 18 hours of being free, I guess you could say, you ended up with another 15 years, which pretty much put your lights out, right? Years is not attached to the federal sentence. The fifteen years is is is, is for the state. It runs with the. It, actually, it runs with the federal sentence. But I got two, three, and three more years to do in the state of Illinois. So that's like a total of eight years, eight more years after I leave here at seventy one. Wow! So you'll be almost almost eighty years old by the time you walk out if you make it that long. Are you afraid to get out, David, at that age? No, I mean, uh, uh, no, but I, I can tell you this here. You know, sometimes you got to make hard decisions. And at that age, I don't know exactly what I would do, but if I didn't have much time and I was just going to be a burden on, on somebody uh, who don't even know me to send my family, uh, I don't even think I would go. I would come right back. You would come. Freedom, if, uh, freedom when you can enjoy it is it, beautiful. But freedom when you're just going out there to become somebody, a liability to somebody, I, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that at all. I understand. I understand. But it's, it's sad. It's just a sad, sad position to be in. Yeah, but, but here's the thing, though. It don't have to be that way. It, it, it really don't have to be that way. This is the people's decision. But I am uneducated, and other people are miseducated. You know, I see people in here all the time. I'm working with a third grade education. I explain that to people all the time. I, I had to say something in court because I was miseducated to believe that everything they were telling me through facts. I was uneducated. I questioned everything that went on. Right now, my 35 year sentence is illegal. It's a 20 year statutory max for the year, for the case that I'm charged that I have 35 years for. Uh, I just filed the first step act to get my sentence reduced, and they told me, no, your criminal, your, your prison record is grounds for a denial. But what they don't understand is that the same thing they use to deny people the right to vote, they use that same discretion to deny me. Justice, and I don't know, understand why we ask for the people who created injustice for justice. I don't understand that for the life of me. I did. They they didn't care about me when they did it to me. So when they have a chance to correct it, I, you know, I don't see why they would do it, and they just told me why. But the people I love and the people who love me, you know, that's the end of the call with David, right? And it is a sad reality. Did you hear what he said? That if he were to get out, he'd probably just come right back because he didn't want to be a burden on anybody. Is that really the reason? Or is it because he's just so used to being in prison? Maybe he's really afraid to get out. You know, David's a pretty well-known dude out of Illinois, man. Um, a lot of brothers have done time with this brother. You know, he was a dangerous dude. He remains a dangerous dude as far as, you know, if you disrespect him, he's going to handle his business. So I'm surprised that guy said something like that to him. But, you know, as you get older in prison, you know, the younger guys kind of take over. Kind of like when you watch National Geographic, right? You know, the old lion, when he gets too old, they take over. They get rid of him. They demolish him violently, and he's gone. He's no longer the ruler. And, you know, it's a sad day when you say, you know what, after 30 or 40 years, I mean, Dave going to be in prison for probably a total of, about 40 something years. And if he makes it that long, he's going to walk out. He's going to walk out to a world that he doesn't know. Any type of social integration is probably impossible. Any type of employment, impossible. The only thing that he knows is prison. And look when he escaped from the Cook County Jail, what he said. He just looked around like, wow. He was amazed. Amazed at what he gave up. What his decisions to commit criminal activity resulted in, was giving up all of this. The green trees, the food, the people, 
freedom, the smell of real air. And I say real air because the air on that side don't smell the same. Gave it all up, man. Gave it all up. And he went hard when he was in prison, went hard against the cops, went hard against other people that, you know, he felt disrespected him. And he paid for it with his life. And he's right. Sadly, he's probably not going to get the opportunity to get out of prison and do something to come right back. Because David's probably going to die in prison. He's going to die an old, sad man. But yet he came to prison as a young, healthy man who made bad choices. And those bad choices forever changed the course of his life. Blow down the razor wire TV. Get it together, man. Make the right choices so you don't end up like David. With respect, blow down the razor wire TV. Until tomorrow, we're out.